Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory, together with your Father and your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome our, our speaker this evening, who is an assistant professor of sacred scripture at Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Uh, after being raised a Catholic, he spent some years in the evangelical so-called mega churches and, and, and earned his master's at Wheaton College grad, Graduate School and Evangelical University. Uh, he returned to the Catholic Church in the year 2000. Is that right, Dr. Smith? Yeah. In 2000, um, and uh, graduated from Loyola with a PhD, um, and uh, specialized in New Testament and early Christianity. Uh, he's a frequent speaker in parishes and seminaries and universities. Uh, he's appeared on EWTN. He's the author of numerous essays and two books. Um, he has two children, lives in rural Maryland. And uh, just delighted to, to welcome him back to the Institute. And uh, it's good to have you. So, again, everyone that's participating, get out your Bible. We don't do Bible studies without Bibles at the Institute of Catholic Culture. So get out your Bible, dust it off, get out your, uh, your markers, highlighters. I've got mine ready. I've got my Bible ready right here. Um, and uh, I'm going to be studying right alongside you. A little Bic pen with the different colors to underline with. Wonderful little tool. And let's dive in. Dr. Smith, it's all yours. God bless. Thank you, Deacon Sabatino, and also Monica for all the great help. And happy Easter to everybody. Uh, I second everything Deacon said about uh, the church using the technology, not being daunted, not being afraid, doing our best to roll up our sleeves together, and we can do it. So here we are, and happy Easter. I'd like to read um, and ask you to open your Bibles. Uh, this is certainly a great opportunity for us to use those Bibles that we have. So I want to ask all of you to open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. And this, uh, this series is called So Great a Cloud of Witnesses. And indeed, that's what we have around us, spurring us on. And so let's read really our theme verse for this series. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Therefore. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that was set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. It's our opening scripture and our opening prayer. And it's great to be back with you. Not only, Deacon, did I bring the Bible, but I also brought a temple with me so we can talk a little bit about some of the, the beautiful theology that's in this book. And it's my, my heart's desire to share with you my own love for this book. I can tell you, the first time I read this book, I was truly blown away. And I don't just say that lightly. I mean, it just really rocked my world. I, I'm only sad that our seminarians at Mount St. Mary's are not required to, to, to take this book. Many will take it as an elective, and I'll sometimes sit in my office and just have conversations with them about it, and we all 
want to say, hey, what's the matter? I mean, this beautiful seminary is not including this book, but there's only so much we can do. So I think it's a great blessing that here we are uh, considering this book together. I'm going to try my best with you to share uh, really the, the heart of this book and to walk through it uh, chapter by chapter. And so hopefully you have your handout. Let's take a look at it. Um, it's 10 pages. Don't be daunted. There is a lot here, but we'll do our best to try to make our way through it. I want to begin with a little bit of background information, just so you have the raw essentials of what you need. But to start with, I want to kind of set the stage for who wrote this book, what we know, uh, when it was written, and so on. As you see, we have an introduction to the letter. Have your pen out, have your Bible out. Uh, we can certainly take questions later. A few basic questions that maybe you've been wondering as you prepared for tonight. Who wrote this book? When was it written? And who were they writing to? And what's, what's the larger purpose of it here? Well, here's the, the good news and the bad news. We do know who the divine author of this book is, and that is the Holy Spirit. So we can take great confidence and great comfort in that. The challenge on a human level is we don't really have all the data to say definitively who the human author is. Let me give you some background. Traditionally, the early church fathers, and really continuing throughout many ages of the church, ascribed this book to St. Paul, the apostle, along with Romans and First and Second Corinthians and so on. Now, in the modern period, um, that has been a bit more debated, and I won't go into all the reasons for it. Um, my own suggestion is that it makes a lot of sense to suggest that the doctrine, the substance of this book, belongs to St. Paul, Saint Paul's mind. So whether or not St. Paul wrote it out by hand, or whether it was someone who was in his companionship, much like Barnabas or Timothy or possibly Aquila, or other people that are known associates of St. Paul, um, it may be the case that it comes from this so-called Pauline circle. Okay? But again, we can rest easy, because whether it was Aquila, or Barnabas, or Timothy, Timothy or St. Paul himself, uh, we know that the divine spirit is guiding this person, who was indeed um, a person who was in the company of St. Paul, and therefore would be called what the catechism calls an apostolic man, much like Mark, much like St. Luke. They were not in the company of the Twelve, but because they were in the companionship of uh, St. Peter and St. Paul, uh, we can rest in confidence to know that on a human level, they had that good eyewitness testimony from one of the apostles. Okay, the date of it, I, I know uh, this may seem like a, well, who cares question, but it's actually important. The more we get into this letter, I think you'll see that there is a reason I want to go through the dating with you momentarily. Um, the majority view is that a lot of the New Testament epistles were written later and the Gospels as well in the 80s or 90s. And if you open up most commentaries, like the one I have here, by Craig Coaster, good commentator, a lot of people will say it was written in the 80s or 90s. But there is a minority view of uh, particularly Catholic and evangelical scholars that suggest that this book may have been written earlier, possibly in the 60s. And my suggestion is this. You may want to make a special note in your, in your, either in your Bible, in the opening page to Hebrews, or in your notes that it makes the most amount of sense to see that the thrust of Hebrews was written, this is why I brought this with, in the shadow of this temple. Now we know, because you're such an astute and a hardworking group of Bible students, we know when the, when the temple was destroyed, right? In 70 AD, there was a four-year war between the Romans and the Jews, and God's temple was destroyed definitively, once and for all, in 70 AD. Now, if we read the book of Hebrews in the shadow of the temple, that is to say, with the temple still standing and priests offering sacrifices and people going in, then I think it will help us to make a lot more sense. Now, if it turns out that we're wrong about that, the book of Hebrews still makes just as much sense, but I would suggest this gives us the most reasonable, logical context. I'll say more about that in just a moment. Turn to Hebrews 3 with me, if you would, and you can see we get a little clue as to who the audience is. He doesn't name them, but in Hebrews chapter 3, he describes them as holy brethren, as holy brethren. And again, in chapter 12, he does the same. Now open your Bible with me to Hebrews chapter 10, and I think we get another insight about who they are and what they're going through. Because in chapter 10, in verse 32, the author of Hebrews describes them as undergoing persecution. Listen to what he says. Recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. 
Now, enlightenment is uh, a reference to baptism. The early church referred to uh, the sacrament of baptism, the sacrament of faith, as a kind of enlightened, being enlightened with the mind of Christ and being born anew by the Holy Spirit. And so from the time that they were first baptized until this time, they've experienced various persecutions. Now, let's get to the heart of who this audience is. And here you may want to also take some notes. My suggestion for us is to see this audience as a group of Jewish believers. But let me take that up a notch. My suggestion, along with others as well, would be that this audience are not just Jewish believers, but very likely Levites, and in particular priests, who, though living in Jerusalem and as people who had been faithful to God's temple in the past, had converted to Christianity, and as we just learned a moment ago in chapter 10, were enlightened, that is to say baptized, were sort of stuck between two worlds. On one hand, they're faithful to their ancestral beliefs as Jews, the Sabbath, circumcision, the Torah, and so on. And as priests, they would have still been offering sacrifices and offerings in the temple whenever they serve there. But now, how does that fit together with their being Christians and being called to worship and take of the Holy Eucharist? It would have led to questions and perhaps even controversies and perhaps even some abandoning the faith altogether not sure if they could, on the one hand, go to the temple and serve, on the other hand, participate in the early Christian koinonia, Christian community. Um, and there is some evidence that supports this. Uh, turn the book of Acts, and in Acts chapter 6, St. Luke tells us that there was a group of early Jewish priests who were also believers. And so there is some supporting evidence. This is what we read in Acts chapter 6. Same chapter, by the way, that talks about the diaconate. Um, he says, and the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many priests were obedient to the faith. That is to say, submitted to baptism, were obedient to the bishop and were being catechized as new Christian believers. And so I would suggest that armed with this knowledge, we can safely posit that this book is aimed probably primarily at a group of people who are very close to Jerusalem very closely tied to the temple and temple sacrifices, but struggling to work it out. And so this homily or this letter is really designed to reinforce the faith of Christian believers, primarily from a Jewish background and priestly background, so that it would have a domino effect on the faith of many others. What I mean by that is, if you can really uh, fortify these Jewish Christian believers who are priests, imagine the effect it would have on many people that are in their world. Think about how every priest has so many others that he, that he interacts with. And so being able to bring these people to a greater faith would probably have a deeper sense of encouraging. Uh, a few more uh, contextual notes, folks, and then we're going to dive in. Um, on the top of page two, if you want to follow along, you can see that I pose a question is this a homily? Is this a letter? And in some sense, it's both. Um, Hebrews does incorporate certain elements of what we would call classic rhetoric, styles of speech. And you uh, can see them in when you read Romans or other letters. It's called the letter to the Hebrews. And yet at the same time, if you open up to chapter one, because we're going to be turning there momentarily, you can see that it lacks the kind of introduction or greeting that Paul often places at the beginning of his letters. If you compare it, for example, with Romans or Corinthians, either first or second, what you see that's lacking is that greeting, I, Paul, writing to you, the Galatians or Romans, right? And so it lacks some of those features of um, epistles or uh, like Paul's letters, and yet at the same time, it's clearly written in the style of a letter. What I would say in terms of the style of this Christian New Testament book is that it's more of a homily than a letter in the sense that he's exhorting them. Um, Hebrews 13.2 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, bear with my word of exhortation, tu logu tes paraklesos, word of exhortation. And I want you to say that with me. Don't be ashamed in your, your own living room, wherever you are. 
Parakalo. Parakalo means to exhort. And you can see, as it says on the notes, it's trying to embolden one person, another person, to go deeper into their beliefs, to take action. So this is really a letter that's not just dry theology, but is really an encouragement, an admonition, to fan the flames. Um, and even though this is written many, many centuries ago to a likely group of Jewish believing priests who are also Christians, we too today need to be likewise exhorted with some of the challenging and beautiful teachings in this book. Now, one last note, and then we'll dive in. There are a few key themes that I want you to learn tonight about this letter. Let me suggest three, and they're also on the page for you on page two. The first has to do with the priesthood of Jesus. The second has to do with the new covenant and its place over the old. And the third has to do with endurance. First, priesthood of Jesus Christ, more than any other book, and I mean any of the 27 books in the New Testament, this book goes further and deeper in advocating that Jesus Christ is indeed a priest, and not only a priest, but a high priest, and not only a high priest, but our true and one eternal, that is to say, once for all, eternal high priest. So he's going to raise the name of Jesus Christ up for these believers, for them to contemplate him as the true and eternal high priest. And in some sense, the challenge for them will be to make a kind of disconnection from the earthly models that they had had in the Old Testament of the former times. Here's a good example of that in Hebrews 4, 14. If you turn there, and please don't just look at the page. Most of these, some of them are on the page, most of them are not. But I want you to open and read the Bible. There's something very important. I really mean this and feel strongly about it, that mechanically, when we read God's word, when, we, when our eyes touch the page, when it, it, it's sort of like it kisses our mind, right? We need to have that dynamic with our senses of reading God's word for ourselves and finding it. So in Hebrews 4, 14, we read, Since then we have such a great high priest, who is passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. That is to say, to our baptismal promises, to our faith, right? To our creed, to what we believe. Um, that word, hirus, priest in Greek, occurs 27 times in this relatively short letter. 27 times. It's about more than more, about two to a chapter. And 15 of those has to do with Jesus as our high priest, our kiarus, not just priest, but high priest, that particular individual who went into the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum on that day of atonement, which we're going to get into that. So that's the first key theme, okay? The second key theme is the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. The word diatheke is the Greek word for covenant. Remember, a covenant is that binding relationship that God invites us into, beginning back with our father Abraham, when God first initiated a covenant with humanity, and then continuing through the figures like Noah and, Abraham, uh, and, and Moses and David, leading to, forward to the new covenant. But this author wants to make a key distinction and say, we're, now, we're no longer in the old covenant. Now, he's not putting it down. He's not diminishing what we would call the Old Testament, what he would simply call the scriptures. But he is trying to make a key distinction that we are no longer under that old covenant. So turn with me to Hebrews 8. This is where he really gets into the thick of things with this idea of covenant. In Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 6, we read that if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no reason to look for a second. Now again, it, it sounds on the surface like he's in some sense, demeaning the old covenant. But again, I remind you, he's using a certain amount of rhetoric here. He's challenging them. You know, it's a little bit like he's giving them a friendly grab on the, on the shoulders and the lapels and saying, hey, friend, you know, I really want to talk to you about this system of beliefs that you're under. Because the old covenant, while it was given by God and served a, 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 a very important purpose for a period of time, that time has now ended with the, um, with the birth of Jesus Christ and with his life, death, resurrection, and ascension at the right hand of the Father, 
We can see it in the rear view mirror. We can be glad of it, but we're no longer tied in that. So that's the second theme, is that the new covenant surpasses and goes beyond the old. And then there's a third theme, and it's a very pastoral one. That's one I want to make sure we get to next week, later in uh, the hour next week, and that is holy endurance. Holy endurance. Turn with me to chapter 12. This takes us right back to our theme that we started with in Hebrews 12. While you're turning there, I can say, you know, this book dives deep into theology and Christology right away. So I hope you're excited about that. But as the letter progresses and comes to an end, you can see the pastoral heart of this author. Because he's not only interested in infusing with them with deep Christology and theology, he's interested in practical living, moral living, encouragement, and endurance. So let's look again at chapter 12, where he says, like he comes to this great conclusion, right? He says, therefore, by the way, when you see those little words, you ought to be circling them in your, in your Bibles, reminding you, oh, this is probably a concluding point, or he's probably making a transition to now a new point. And that's exactly what he's doing. Therefore, like everything that's come before has taken us to this point, and now we can say, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, every burden, right? as well as every sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. And I just wanted to point out for you a couple of things. First, we'll get into this next week. He's drawing upon athletic contests, right? And so there's a certain kind of sporting quality to um, the way this letter works. And he uses a very graphic and everyday metaphor to be able to say, this is really a race. It's a challenge. It's one that you're, it's going to encompass your whole life and your body, your mind and your soul. And you need to run in such a way and train in such a way that you're able to endure. That's the first point here. And then the second point in, about Hebrews 12 is look at your page here. You can see I'm giving you the Greek word, martyron, right? Witness, such a great clot of witnesses, holy martyrs, We need to thank God and we need to, I think, pray for more of the spirit of the martyrs in our lives. Not so much in like, Lord, you know, uh, let me, let me go out there and give my life away in some actual literal sense, perhaps, but that we would be self-sacrificial vessels in the Lord's hand. Lord, what is it that you want to do with me today, tonight, in this hour? Okay. So those are some things to keep in mind. If you do so, I think we'll be in good shape. Dr. Smith, I did want to mention to, uh, to all of the attendees that Dr. Smith's introduction that he just gave is directly in accord with the teachings of the church on how to do scripture study. If you go to your section in the catechism, in the first part of the catechism on scripture, uh, it talks about identifying uh, when the text was written, who wrote it, who it was written to, and the purpose for which it was written. And if you can ascertain those items, you're going to be well on your way to, uh, to interpreting the text in a responsible way. And so as, as Dr. Smith was, was, was mentioning this, I was, uh, was talking, I was learning a number of things myself, first off, but to, just to tell you, write these things down, because if you got these things, and I, I've taken what Dr. Smith has said, and I wrote them right there at the beginning of, the gospel, so that every time, or the the epistle, so every time I turn to Hebrews, I'm going to have that there, written, this is the time, this is who's writing it, this is to whom it's written, and this is its purpose, and if you've got that, you're going to be able to read it with profit, so thank you, Dr. Smith, for just a wonderful little introduction there, excellent, and uh, I won't interrupt you anymore. No, that's okay. Deacon uh, Carnazzo, I have to ask you and uh, everyone listening tonight, did did you hear what Pope Francis said about not wanting to trade a $1,000 Bible if someone gave it to him for his old leafy Bible with all the things, pages falling out and everything? I love that he said that, and it's all torn up. And Dr. Scott Hahn's the same way. You see his Bible, I'm like, Scott, get a new Bible. But he's like, no way, man, this this is everything I need. And so I concur with you completely. Yeah, absolutely, which is why you need a hard-bound Bible. You should have a good hard-bound Bible, not some cheap paperback. All right, let's continue, folks. Uh, On the bottom of page two, in accord with what Deacon was saying, what we've been talking about, having some sense of the structure of a book that you're reading is important. And here's the reason why. It's kind of like if you're going down a river, and you have in mind, okay, this is a 10-mile river, 
we're at the checkpoint, we're at the halfway mark and so on and so forth. It's gonna help you to navigate better to know where you're at and where things are in relation to one another. Let's just take a quick look at this one. I've tried to make this a very simple outline. Sometimes they, they're extensive, this is a very basic one. Essentially we have six parts to this letter. We have a prologue, which is the opening paragraph, which we're gonna take a look at in just a moment. And then essentially we have number two, three, four, and five. So four parts to the body of the letter, two, three, four, and five. So that would take us essentially from chapter one, verse five, all the way to chapter 13, verse 18. And just like there's an opening to the letter with the prologue, there's a closing doxology in the last five verses of the letter. So what we're dealing with is essentially an opening and a closing, and then four interrelated parts. And with that in mind, we are ready to go. So let's take a look at and read Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And the prologue consists of the first four verses. So I want you to follow along with me in your own Bible. We may be using slightly different translations, but we'll all get there together. Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by his word of power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And having become as much superior to the angels as to the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now, I know if this letter is new to you, some of you might be thinking, oh boy, what did I get myself into? Because this book already sounds pretty heady, pretty thick, but I want to reassure you we're going to get through this together. Um, so this is the prologue. This is the author's beginning. And there is a lot in here. In fact, we could almost take the whole time and just study these four verses. It's that dense. It's that thick. But let's see what we can say about it. The first thing I would, I would point out to you is that the author of the book is calling attention to the advent of Jesus Christ as the key turning point in all of salvation history and indeed all of human history. Um, in some sense, you could say he's contrasting everything that has come before, which is the past, with what I call the eternal now, that is to say the, the present age of the sun, right, until Christ's return. It's remarkable, really, because for a Jewish audience, there is only the eternal God, right? And now he's talking about the acts of God from creation up through the time of the Son as sort of stage one. And then the time from Jesus Christ through the present and continuing into the future until Christ's return as the present age. Okay, so that's the first very important thing to see. He's making this great distinction between the past and the present. He's also giving us a kind of methodology, right, for reading the Old and New Testament. Because if you think about it, he's talking about reading the old in light of the new and the new in light of the old. This is one of the clearest statements I think we have in the scriptures for seeing the integration of the Old and New Testament, but also all the ways in which the New Testament surpasses the old because the New Testament is the new covenant which is our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we go on to the next verses, there is already a lot of Christology just in these opening verses, and I want to point some of these out to you. Um, I'm going to give you some of the terms in English and then the Greek and try to explain each of them for you. The first key word, I think, is this word heir. Jesus is called the heir of all things. Um, the word in Greek is kleronomos. And it means someone who possesses an estate or a beneficiary. So imagine what, you know, if you're the Jewish priest hearing this, and your loyalty is to God and God alone, and you pray the Shema, right? Hero is, or the Lord our God, the Lord is one. How encouraging or perhaps challenging it would have been 
to hear Jesus Christ being described in such a way that maybe only in the past they had heard God the Father described as the heir of all things. And then the second point here, who, through whom God created the world. Very interesting Greek word, epoiesin. It's on the top of page three, right, under letter B. And what's really interesting is that in the Greek version of Genesis, in the Septuagint, it's the same term. Let's go back to Genesis 1, 1 for a minute, where we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And epoiesin is the same term. Epoiesin means created in the past tense. That's used in Genesis 1, 1 and here in Hebrews. So he's making that connection using the scriptures to teach a new truth that it's not just God who created the world, but God through his divine son created the world. Another really interesting word for us to meditate on is radiance. Apaugasma. Say that one with me. It's kind of fun to say. Apaugasma. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. And in the Old Testament book of wisdom, which is another amazing book, the wisdom of Solomon, we read that Lady Wisdom is a reflection or a paugasma of light, of eternal light. And so it's the same term that's used here, except instead of applying it to this figurative characteristic of God, of Lady Wisdom, so to speak, he's now applying it directly to the Son, reinforcing what he just said, that it is Jesus who, through whom God created the world. And now he's teaching us that because Jesus is an apaugasma, it's like he's a mirror of the Father, right? Which is to say that when you're gazing at the face of Jesus Christ, and when you're in Jesus Christ, you're gazing through him into the love of the Father and the face of the Father. It's a remarkable statement, a remarkable word. Um, upholding. He says that he's upholding the universe by his word of power. So two Greek words here, Theron and dunamis. Please say them with me, Theron and dunamis. A Theron has the sense of bringing or carrying, right? If I had, um, you know, something that I had placed on the back of a mule because it was too heavy for me to carry, like a heavy weight, right? and I was going to walk into town with that mule and sell it to someone, I might say that Pharaoh, it was placed on that meal. It's a sense of bringing, of responsibility, bringing, carrying. Beautiful, right? Upholding the universe. It's an active word. And another active word here, dunamis. It's where we actually get our English word dynamite. Uh, very, very powerful here, right? Upholding the universe by his word of power. These are some of the most, what we would call the, some of the highest Christology that is teaching us who Jesus is and what the, Jesus does in the whole of the New Testament. This is why I encourage all Catholics to read Hebrews and meditate on it, because it's some of the richest Christology or theology in the New Testament. And then another key word, the last one I want to call your attention to is purification. Um, katharsemon. Katharsemon. This is temple language. If you look down at the footnotes, false fine print for us, but in uh, Mark 144, katharsemon is used where Jesus heals someone, right? And then he says, go show yourself to the priest and, and offer for your catharsemon, cleansing. So it's temple language. So to recap, Jesus is the heir of all things. He's the possessor of our souls, the possessor of the church, possessor of the cosmos. It's all in his hands. God created the world through him. Jesus is the radiance or a mirror, right? Like a spotless mirror of light of the image of God, he upholds the, the universe by his word of power, and he has made atonement or purification, which is a reminder of the temple language, which would have probably hit these priests right between the eyes because these were priests of the temple. Now, the next section of the letter is chapter 1, 5 to 2, 18. So let's try to take this and take a chunk of it and look at it and meditate on it. This is the part of the letter where the author gets into this whole business of comparing Jesus to the angels. And I bet you're asking yourself, that seems odd. I mean, of course, Jesus is superior to the angels. Why would he even have to say that? Um, 
a little bit of background. Although angels are all over the place in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, especially in Jesus' day, had various points of view on angels. And frankly, some were what we would call orthodox, and some were what we would call heterodox. There was speculative thinking about angels. Um, but certainly I would say they had a culture that was imbued and imbibed with the reality of the angels all around them. The question was that how did they relate to Jesus Christ in light of these other powerful celestial beings? And he's going to clarify that. So that's the major thrust of this part of the letter. And I will tell you it's also one of my favorite parts of the letter, but I may well say that about other parts as we go on, because it's just, it's, there's so many parts of it that I love. Now, for your sake and edification, I've given you an overview in each section of the letter. And I, you may want to write some notes at the beginning of 1-5 to know where this section begins for yourself, so you can go back and study it later. And just put down whatever words are helpful for you. But here is the overview. And again, you're going to get an overview for every major section that follows. But let's read this together. In the first major section of Hebrews, again on page three, the sacred author uses scripture in order to authoritatively assert that Jesus is superior to the angels, king of the angels, superior to the angels, displaying his superiority by becoming a little lower than the angels and taking on human flesh. Now, this sounds maybe a little bit um, circular, right? He's above the angels, he's superior to them, and I'm going to explain that he's superior by his becoming lower than the angels. Sounds confusing, right? But as we look at these scriptures, I think what you'll begin to see is that what he's really doing is giving us a beautiful and glorious theology of the incarnation. This is his starting point to build up this audience, and he begins with that essential truth of the incarnation, something that any angel, no angel, could ever claim. It was God's Son alone who took on human flesh. And so, yes, he wants to celebrate that Jesus is superior to the angels by descending, right? Like Philippians says, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, right? but he took on the form of a servant, a slave, right? Beautiful hymn in Philippians chapter two. Now let's take a look at some of these. And again, have your Bible out. There's no way to do this well without an open Bible. So let's take a look at some of these statements that the author makes about Jesus in Hebrews one and Hebrews two. Now very likely, I don't have your Bibles obviously in front of me. I only have mine, but it's very likely that you will be able to see and spot these Old Testament references. There's a number of them because most Bibles will put them in either italics or indented form. Can you check your Bible, for example, in verse 5, where it says, For which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, they have begotten you, right? Um, some Bibles may not have italics or indents, but they may have um, a little notation, a footnote to point you to the reference. But that's important for you to study and know when you're looking at this book because what it's telling us is that Hebrews is quoting scripture. And I'll, 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 on your outline are all the scripture quotes that he mentions. But what I want to do is um, draw the first seven of these or so together. On your outline, you can see that in Hebrews 1.5, and again, he's comparing Jesus to the angels, right? He says, to what angel did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have begotten you. It's kind of a rhetorical question, right? But he wants the audience to contemplate that in their mind, to say, all to no angel, right? But rather than just saying that, he's using the authority of Scripture. Because that expression, you are my son, today I have begotten you, is actually from Psalm 2, verse 7. Another one in chapter 1, verse 6. He's again trying to help them see Jesus' uniqueness in contrast to the angels. And again, you know, to what angel did God ever say, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son? Well, that's from Psalm 97, verse 7. The next one, it's like we get one perverse in verse 7. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Drawing on Psalm 104. We can go back and look these up. But be marking these down in your text so you can go back and look at them later, please. 
in verse 8. And I'm going to try to put all these together and tell you what I think he's doing with these. Of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And so on, right? So here he's drawing upon yet another psalm, this time 45. So we got Psalm 2, Psalm 97, Psalm 104. And by the way, I didn't even mention, but also 2 Samuel 7, 14. And he's not done yet. This is like a machine gun of, of scriptures, right? And look at down with me in your Bible, chapter 1, verse 10 to 12. Another quote, this time from Psalm 102, which reads, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Verse 13, the last one we want to meditate on just for a moment here, he says, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool? And that's a very, very important scripture later in the book because it's from Psalm 110. We'll come to that later. But put an asterisk, highlight that in yellow, make sure you know that we're dealing with Psalm 110. These are all important, but that one is of prime importance. Let's go on a bit further. So he's taking on and giving a critique of the angels in contrast to the preeminence and uniqueness of Jesus Christ. And he's going to continue to do this all the way through chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, we read, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, which could be you know, our, our, our slogan of Scripture insight for tonight here, right? We need to pay attention to the Scriptures he's telling them. Because what he's telling them is, look, you guys have had these scriptures. But you haven't been drawing them out for all the richness that God has implanted in them. He's saying, look, you know these. You've read these. You probably have many of these committed to memory. Why have you not seen these things? It's a bit of a challenge to them and to us to really be praying with the scriptures. God, enlighten my mind. Help me to see what it is that you want me to see. Now, he says that it was the angels that declared these messages to be reliable in chapter 2, verse 2. Well, what he's getting at there is, and this is in one of your footnotes, that ancient Jewish tradition held that Abraham was tutored in the law by the angels. Isn't that interesting? You say, well, I thought the law was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. And that comes along in Exodus chapter 20. But in my Bible, Abraham's story is told in Genesis 12 and following. So if the law wasn't given till the time that Moses went up on the mountain, how was it that Abraham was tutored in it if it didn't yet exist? And that's where we reach a mystery of God's law and of Holy Scripture itself. Because the ancient Jews firmly believed that the law was given and spoken forth when the world was created. Actually, in the book of Sirach, and I put this footnote on your page, go and look it up later. We must read these deuterocanonical books, folks. We must. There's so much truth in them. But write it down in chapter 1, Sirach 44, verse 19 and 20. And you'll see that Sirach says there that Abraham kept the law. Once again affirming what this author seems to be getting at. He goes on in chapter 2 to quote Psalm 22, which again is the Psalm Jesus cited when he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, let's step back and ask the question. What the heck's going on? Why all these scriptures? You know, we've got 7, 8, 9, 10 scriptures. He's, you know, wrestling with something that we would take for granted, that Jesus is, of course, he's superior to the angels. Did you notice this? Most of the scriptures that the author cites come from the Psalter. Did you see that? Look back at your outline, look at your notes, and you can see seven or eight of them are all from the Psalms. And here's my question. What's the significance of that? Yes, we've got some from Isaiah, some from elsewhere, but the majority, overwhelming number of them are from the Psalms. And I would suggest this is where 
our understanding of audience makes a big difference. If our proposal is right and supported by the book of Acts, that there was a group of early Levitical priests who were also Christians, who were wrestling with making sense of all of that in light of the temple, in light of Jesus Christ, what he's just done is give them a catechesis in believing in Jesus Christ from their own songbook. Because the Psalms were not only the words of God, right, spoken by the angels, Hebrew says, but the very liturgical book, right, the very liturgical book by which they sung while they were doing their priestly work in the temple. Here's the challenge. As he said to them, we should pay more attention to it. I think what he's saying is, all the while that you've been polishing the brass across the beautiful temple and the mahogany, and if you're lucky enough, serving at the bronze altar, right, or going into the holy place and beholding the bread of the presence or the menorah, or even anywhere in the vestibules of the temple, and heard the choirs of angels singing, right, in the, in the um, Levitical choirs that were singing the Psalms, you were already being catechized in who Jesus Christ is, and you may not have even known it. It's also, if I can say a brilliant strategy, it's kind of a nice end around, right? Because if they're there and they're like, yeah, I'm not really sure about this, this Jesus guy, right? That he's basically taking their very lifeblood, the temple, the songbook of the temple, the, the, the scriptures, and he's demonstrating to them Jesus's incarnation and witnessing to Jesus's superiority over the angels using their very scriptures. Brilliant. Now, um, as I said, if the author is trying to persuade a group of largely Jewish and priestly figures, he's already done, and I think in my book, an A-plus job at trying to get their attention, get them to think about their Bibles and their faith and their worship in a brand new light. Turn the page with me, if you would, and let's take a look at chapter 3 through 5, and I'm, I'm hoping we can get through at least this next section here. So, in chapter 3, 4, and 5, we come to another major cycle or section of the book, and you can find that in your notes on page 4. I'll give you a second to turn there. And at the same time, please open up your Bible to chapter 3 of the book of Hebrews. And once again, I try to give you an overview. I encourage you to write notes in your Bible as to what's in this section. Let me give you the snapshot. And you'll go back and you'll have that. What's chapter 3 and 4 or 5 about? Give you the snapshot and you can read it on for yourself. Here it is. In this section of the book, we now come to really the body of the letter. Here, the sacred author is going to focus us clearly on the high priesthood of Jesus. And this is important because this particular audience would not have accepted Jesus as a priestly figure. And we'll talk more about why. But I think you probably already know the answer. Again, you're a smart Bible study audience, right? And you know that Jesus was not a Levite. What tribe was Jesus? This is where I want to be there and hear you call out, right? He was of the tribe of Judah, just like his father David, right? And this is probably some of the apprehension that if he's trying to draw them into a kind of a sacramental and mystical Christianity, but in some way they're paralyzed and stuck by moving forward from accepting the mysticism, the beauty of the sacraments, and embracing Jesus Christ in this priestly way because they simply can't imagine it as faithful Jews. The problem is not that they're not faithful people. The problem in this case is that they are faithful people. But their theology is so rooted in the old covenant that he needs to lift them out of it. And that's what he's doing. But in the same way, I would argue that this author has a, a desire to lift us into a deeper Catholicism, to a higher Catholicism. Because we need to contemplate our Lord Jesus Christ as our high priest and also our sacrifice. And evangelistically, we need to help other Catholics do this. Because I'm convinced if we can help Catholics understand Jesus as our high priest and our sacrifice, it will be incredible in terms of the effect it will have on our churches and parishes and friends. Now, 
let's turn to chapter five. Actually, let's see. Uh, I think I want to, um, did we skip a section here? I think we did. Let's go back to chapter three here. So I'm getting ahead of myself. In chapter three, the author makes some comparisons between Moses and Jesus. And I want to sum this up for the sake of time and say that what he's really trying to do here again is to help these readers go beyond the old covenant. Just look quickly with me in chapter three, where he says, for example, verse two, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house, Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Of more glory than Moses. See, once again, we're dealing with an audience that has such great um, love for Abraham, for Moses, and for these figures that it's keeping them from moving forward. Turn with me quickly to John's Gospel, chapter 1, and you'll see that John faces a very similar situation with his audience. In John's prologue, chapter 1 of John, verse 18, actually 17 and 18, John makes a very remarkable statement when he says, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God or only son who's in the, at the Father's side. He has revealed the Father and made him known. And what I would argue, we don't have time to talk about that passage in depth, but I would say is, similarly to Hebrews, John is trying to get his audience to go beyond Moses. We're not downgrading Moses here, but we're trying to see that while Moses served a primary role in giving the law, Moses was not the one who gazed at the Father face to face from all eternity, or is it at the right hand of the Father, as Hebrews will say. So again, he's challenging them to go deeper into their faith, or as C.S. Lewis liked to say, further up and further in. They don't need to abandon Moses. They don't need to abandon Moses less. We don't need to love the Old Testament any less. We just need to give our all to Jesus Christ. Now, um, some of the most sobering words in the entire letter are found in chapter 3. And I want to point this out to you because it gets into a question that some Christians will pose to Catholics today. Can we or can we not lose our salvation? And there are some false teachings, I, I hate to say, but it's true, that are out there. And it affects a lot of how Catholics think about their faith in a way that is not accurate. So let's take a look at chapter 3, verse 7 and following, where uh, he says, for example, in verse 12, take care, brothers, take care, lest there be any evil in you or an unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another as long as it is called today. Isn't that nice? As long as it's called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And you can also turn to chapter 6 and see something similar, very sobering words, where he talks about leaving simple things. You know, it's like we're no longer children. You know, we're we're no longer eating Gerbers, folks, right? So these guys actually have a a deeper faith than they realize, but they need to press on and get beyond the, the baby food and taste the real meat. But it's in that section as well where there's a challenge to not fall away. And I just want to point out a couple of scriptures to you because, you know, a lot of times people will minimize this teaching in Hebrews and say, oh, well, that's, that's just a, a hard saying or something. But let me give you a few others, and I want you to write these down, and you can look them up later. 1 Corinthians 9.24. 1 Corinthians 9.24, which talks about running the race and competing as if to win a, a, a prize. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, you know, everybody runs, but only one person wins. He's saying, look, you know, you're, you're in a race for your, your spiritual life here. And run in such ways to win the prize. Another one, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he uses a similar but different analogy when, he, when Paul says, I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the race. Paul's not boasting, but Paul can talk about that given his resume. He's near the end of his journey, spiritual journey, and he can look back and say, I have, but now I want you to do the same. And finally, one more um, in Philippians 2, verse 12. uh, Paul, St. Paul says that we should work out our faith with what he calls fear and trembling. 
How many of us today would say, you know, how's your spiritual life going? Well, I'm working it out with fear and trembling. But Paul would say that's a good thing. And let me quickly uh, add a note about, um, about this falling away. Obviously, we don't want to, uh, to despair. But I would say this. If there is a, uh, a weakness in Protestants, it's having a presumption that I cannot lose my salvation. And that's something that we as Catholics don't share with our Protestant brothers and sisters, right? That like St. Paul says, we journey on, but we don't presume because God is working with us. He's prepared us to do good works in advance. So we're not afraid, right? But neither are we presuming. But where some uh, Catholic or some Protestants presume, let me also challenge some of us among the Catholics that we don't want to give into the sin of despair either. That's just as dangerous to believe, you know, I'll never go to heaven. I'll never do enough, right? And we need to come back to, to God's grace and remember that we are, as Paul says, saved by faith through grace in Ephesians chapter 2. So I just want to point this out because this book is a nice wake-up call for us to remind us of what God's word and what our catechism says, that we must um, continue on, press on in our faith. And all the good works that you're doing here are some of the examples of living that out, right? I like to put it this way. When someone says, have you been saved? You can say, I have been saved by what Jesus Christ did once for all on the cross. I'm being saved, as St. Paul says, because I'm trying my best to work out my faith day by day with fear and trembling, and I trust that he will save me because he that has prepared me to do good works will bring that through to completion. He will not abandon me so we can have great confidence in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, let's, let's move on to chapter 5. Let's move on to chapter 5, but let's take one verse from chapter 3 with us and, and make it a memory verse for tonight. It's something we sing often in the Mass, right? Chapter 3, verse 15. If today you hear God's voice, harden not your hearts. That's what God wants, right? If today you hear it, and we're hearing it, right? Harden not your hearts. Amen. Now, um, in chapter 5 through 10, we're just going to scratch the surface on this in the next couple of minutes, introduce it, but we'll come back to it big time next week. So turn to chapter 5 with me. And again, I hope you're taking a lot of notes tonight. In this section of Hebrews, we reach the true core and body of the letter. Here, he's going to begin a long, and by long I mean five chapters, discussion of the high priesthood of Jesus. He's already laid the foundation. He's talked in the prologue about how now we're in the today of Jesus Christ. He's talked about the incarnation and how Jesus is superior to the angels by becoming lower than the angels and taking on human flesh to save us. He's reminded us in chapters 3, 4, that Jesus is greater than Moses and that we should work out our faith with fear and trembling and to harden not our hearts, right? Now, all that has brought us to this place. It's kind of like now we're at the 50-yard line and he wants to take us down over the goal line by talking about this new and greater priesthood of Jesus Christ. Okay, in chapter 6, beginning in verse 13, let's just take a look at this and see if we can move through few verses here. Listen to what we read. I want you to read along with me in your own version. He says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, remember Genesis 12, write that down, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless and multiply you. Remember those promises to Abraham. Thus, Abraham having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, Amen, such as it is. We who have fled for a refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone. Behind the curtain, he's talking here about the Holy of Holies, as a forerunner on our behalfs, 
having become a high priest after the order of Melchizedek forever. Okay, there's a lot in this paragraph, but let's try quickly to sum it up. He mentions Abraham and the promises God made to Abraham, right? We're on page five. Now, remember, Abraham was childless with his wife, Sarah, and he was given that promise of a son, but the son, Isaac, didn't come for another 25 years. 75 given the promise, 100 years old, Sarah 99, when it actually happened. So when he's talking about endurable faith, we need to be reminded that sometimes God's timing is not our timing here, right? We always look back with great you know, um, love for Abraham, but then you think about the actual circumstance he went through, waiting a quarter of a century. How many of us have waited for such a long time to see someone come home to the faith in the Lord or some sort of an illness or some sort of healing, and then eventually sometimes God surprises us? Also, this uh, verse 19 about the anchor, what a great verse to make your own tonight, right? The anchor was one of the earliest images of Christianity. And what is an anchor? It holds a boat or a vessel from moving about, from banging about on the waves, from tipping over, and from staying right where it needs to, right? What an incredible verse. But I think we'll have to draw to a close tonight with this last piece where he talks about Jesus as our true and eternal high priest who goes into the inner shrine. And now I can finally get to use my little um, visual here, right? This is a, a little visual of the temple. I had a chance to make this with my, uh, my daughter a couple years ago for a Lenten project. And it, it was hard, but it was fun. And quickly, what you're looking at is an overview of the temple in Jesus' day, what's called Herod's Temple. Let me walk you through it quickly. We have essentially uh, three parts. We have the outer courts. This was called the Court of Women right here, if you can see it, where you would enter into the temple. And this is where the life of the temple among the Jewish people was happening. The outer courts were the courts for the Gentiles. Okay, so this is where women and men would gather. And then you have a gate right here. If you can see it on the side, it's pretty substantial. It's called the Nicanor Gate. And it was only men, in particular, and especially priests, who could go into this area. Men were allowed to observe, provided they were in a state of cleanliness, but it was the priests who are particularly doing duty here and offering sacrifices. The high place here was actually comprised of two components, that tall building. And you write these down. One was the holy place in which there was a menorah, which is a kind of an image of God's light, the tree of life, and also a table of glorious and divine bread given over for the priest to eat. But then there was a veil, and no one ever trespassed beyond that veil except the high priest, what was called the inner place in Hebrews, but once a year on the Day of Atonement. And when we come back next week, I'm, and I'm serious about this, get a good night's sleep the night before, eat a good meal, bring your coffee or water, because it's going to get pretty intense, and wonderfully so, as we begin now to get into the true meat of Hebrews, as we contemplate Jesus, our true high priest. Deacon? Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you very much. A wonderful presentation. I, I was, as you were speaking, I wanted to just yell out, welcome to seminary life. <laughs> welcome, you know, the, uh, the, the opportunity that you're giving to the attendees here is phenomenal. And it's, as you know, as I could tell, as you're trying to get so much material to cover, um, every point that you're mentioning is a Bible study. And so I'd encourage people to take those wonderful notes you provided. And if you haven't gotten them yet, make sure you get on the website, download the, the notes for tonight's talk, and go through and study those. I mean, what a, what a great thing to do this week to read the Psalms, uh, to look back at uh, even I was as you're getting now into chapter 6 and 7, to at least listen to the first part of my series on Swords and Serpents, Salvation History, that we have on our website so you can just kind of remind yourself of who comes first, who comes second, what they did, and so forth. Kind of the, the, the uh, Dr. Smith, I do a kindergarten version of what you're doing. So oh, no. kind of riding the tricycle thing, you know, um, that uh, can be helpful to people to make sure that we have everything in order. Because this chapter six and seven for me in, uh, in, in the epistles is so fundamentally important. And as you're saying, get ready, eat a good meal, because there's so much there to dive into. Um, I'd also add to uh, your wonderful presentation that for those looking at your Bibles, reading your Bibles, Dr. Smith mentioned about 
uh, the possibility of falling away in chapter 3, verse 12. Is that right, doctor? That's right. And again, in chapter 6 as well, it's in there. So, you know, what I would do, I'm going to hold up my Bible here, is take that chapter 3, verse 12, write those texts in that little, there's a little spot there next to you. Um, write that 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 2 Timothy 4, 7, Philippians 2, 12. Write those notes for you because that's where you're going to be taken by your Protestant brother or sister who's, um, uh, who's, who's dealing with these things or maybe where you want to take them. In this case, this is where you would want to take them. So to write those little notes so that you've got a ready-made Bible study, when it comes time to, to teach somebody to share the faith on this particular point, you're going to be ready to go. Okay, a little ready-made Bible study in the, in the side notes of your Bible. That's why he's mentioning writing with your pens and highlighting and things like that. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.